Well, welcome everybody to our presentation today of uh, intro Introduction to Networking Technologies. And I'm Keith Bogart and I will be your presenter today. Thank you everybody for, for joining me. Um, as I always do at the beginning of all my sessions here, as we go through this session, you know, feel free at any point in time to ask whatever questions you may have. Um, if you ask a question and for some reason does not get answered during this session, you got a couple of options. Uh, certainly you can reach out to me and you can see right here, here is my contact information. Let me make that a little bit bigger for you. So you've got my email, you can reach out to me via Twitter, you can reach out to me via LinkedIn, all kinds of ways to get a hold of me. Um, however, ideally, if you have a question, I would actually prefer that you place it uh, within the IEOC forum, um, the INE online community, because that way other people can benefit from your question and they can benefit from the answer. And in the event that you're not familiar with our forum or our, our uh, yeah, our INE online community, just let me show you where it is. There's a couple of ways to get to it. Probably the easiest way is just to go to INE.com. Let me make this a little bit bigger here for you so you can see it. All right. And then from our main homepage here, scroll all the way to the very, very bottom. Lower left-hand corner, you see right here, it says IEOC Forums. Uh, now, you'll need to be logged in with a member's account to get to that, but a member's account is free. I mean, you don't even have to purchase anything from INE to just get a member's account. And once you log in, you're here into the IEOC. And the form that's probably most appropriate for any questions that you would have on today's stuff would either be the Cisco CCNA forum um, or possibly, let's see here. That's probably what I would recommend. The Cisco CCNA forum is probably the most likely. So just click on that. And then within here, you've got a couple. The stuff I'm going to talk about today really is CCENT uh, level. And you can certainly post your question there. But I've noticed there's a lot more people who monitor and are active on the CCNA form, the second one down right here. So I'd probably recommend that you post your question in both places. And that way you'll get an answer and other people can respond to your answer as well. But in the event that you do that, and after a day or two you get nothing, which is unlikely, once again, here's my stuff, my contact information, and you can feel free to reach out to me at any point in time. All right, so let me talk a little bit about what the course objectives are for today. So let, let me paint a, a picture for you of like who I designed this course for. So in my mind, who I'm talking to right now is somebody who is not working in the networking industry at all. I mean, you, you know enough about computers to be able to bring up a web browser and, and watch me, so you at least know that much. But that's probably about it. Uh, networking terminology is completely foreign to you. Now, maybe you've been doing some research because you want to do like a career change or something. You're not happy with where you work, the money you make, and you looked at some uh, job sites and computer networking was towards the top of the list. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, computer networking, sounds like it's a good job. What is it? What is computer networking? What am I getting myself into for that? If that describes you, that's what this session is for. So somebody who knows nothing about computer networking probably haven't even started studying for your CCNA or anything yet. And you just want to sort of have an idea as to what is this thing called computer networking? Is this something that even might sound interesting to me? So you can see there I've, I've written a paragraph on uh, what the objective is. So what are we going to talk about? So I'm going to divide this up into several small sections. I'm going to take questions at the end of each section. We're going to start out with what is a computer network? You know, what is it actually made of? Big, small, what is it? What are some common components of a computer network? Uh, you, as you start getting deeper into computer networking, you're going to hear things called like nodes and hosts and servers and NIC cards and cables. And we're going to talk about what does all that stuff mean? What are some technologies that comprise a network? So once you've got all the physical components in place, the things are hooked up and cabled and connected to each other, what is going on underneath the hood? What are some of the technologies that you might hear like routing, uh, security, data center, collaboration? What does that mean? And how do those things fit into a network? And why would we use technologies like that? 
Then I'll go into computer networking job roles. Um, as you start researching a little bit more with computer networking, you'll see jobs like network admin, network architect, network engineer, and I'll shed a little bit more light on what the differences are between those job roles, what the expectations are of someone who's doing that type of job, and you know what kind of experience does someone need to have to even get into that job. We'll go into computer networking job specialties. Now what I mean by that is, let's take the role for example of a network engineer, which like I said, I'll go into in more detail in a little bit. So with a network engineer, what you do as a network engineer varies depending a lot on the size of the company and the complexity of the network you're working on. If you're a network engineer for a fairly small company that's like, you know, a hundred people or less, chances are you're going to get your fingers in a lot of pretty much everything because you might be the only networking engineer that they have. Or on the flip side of that coin, if you're a networking engineer working for a huge corporation like IBM or Apple or Cisco or something, their network and their IT staff is so huge that it will probably afford you the luxury of specializing. You'll get to be really well versed, really specialized in one particular aspect of the network. And what are some of those specialties that you might be able to do in some of those larger enterprise and service provider networks? And then lastly, I'll finish up with where do I go from here? So after listening to, to me today and having your questions answered, if this still appeals to you and you're thinking, okay, yeah, I'd like to learn more. What do I do next? I'll give you some tips and pointers as far as what next steps are. So let's start by talking about prerequisites. There are none. Uh, the, the fact that you're watching me right now on YouTube means that you've got all the prerequisites you need. So there you go. Ground zero is what this course is starting at. Uh, Q&A. So because there's a lot of you on, on YouTube Live and the questions come at a pretty rapid fire approach, I can't really answer questions as I'm doing the slides, as I'm doing the material. So I've, like I said, I've broken this up into smaller chunks. And after each section, like the section on network components or the section on networking job roles, I'll pause and then I'll look at the, the YouTube live stream and try to answer whatever questions I have, what, whatever questions are there that are unanswered. Um, now, by all means, as we go through here, feel free at any point in time to put your question there into the YouTube live feed because there's a lot of people watching who have a lot of good experience uh, who can answer your questions. So you don't have to wait for me. Uh, if you put your question in, I'm sure somebody will be able to give you a good, polite answer right away. The one other thing I want to mention about that is keeping in mind the audience that this show is
All right, everybody, how about now? Can you guys, uh, I think it's working. I'm looking at it on my side, so I think we're all right. All right, good. All right, awesome. Sorry about that. Um, can anybody tell me where I was when the stream stopped? Do you remember what the last thing was you heard me say? You're kidding me. The last thing you heard me say was my description of uh, the best audience for the class. Nice. So what you're basically telling me is the last 45 minutes have been down. All right. Well, um, all right. Just one moment here. All right, let's just do this then. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put this up. So rather than, you know, I, I will redo the last, you know, 30, 45 minutes if we need to. But rather, before I do that, let me just do this. Let me real quickly here just show you the slides that I basically talked to myself on <laughs> for the last 30 or 45 minutes. Um, and if ever, anybody looking at these slides say to themselves, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm bummed that I missed that. Uh, can you please go over that again? I will certainly do so. Uh, but if the general consensus is, no, you don't need to recover that stuff, then we'll just move on. So as to whether or not you want me to redo that or not. So the only section that you missed was I talked about what is a computer network. Uh, so I started out by talking about the early days of networking, which was devices connected to a single wire. And then networks were connected together via common components called switches. I talked about how then uh, phones were layered onto that network, merging your voice and your data networks together. I then went on to say the next evolution of networking was Wi-Fi, and then we wanted to connect our Wi-Fi network to our wired network, so we would connect those two together. I then talked about how uh, servers, which used to be scattered all over a company, were then merged and then co-located in one building, and that one building was called a data center, and then our network would need to connect to that. And then lastly, our network probably need to have some sort of internet connectivity. So I just told you there in about one minute what took me about five or six minutes to go through previously. I went through some uh, terminology, and I'll just show you the terms here. I talked about what each one of those things is and defined them. I talked about what is, you know, why do we need computer networks? That they allow us to share files, programs, and resources, and I gave some examples of what those things were. And that was it. And that brought us into the Q&A where I suddenly realized that you guys hadn't seen any of that stuff. So, now that you see what you missed, um, does anybody want me to go through those, those slides in more detail? All right, so I'm not seeing any comments coming in. Yeah, yeah, I, I know you guys didn't see those slides, so my question to you is, do you want me to cover that material again? So that's what I'm really looking for. If, if everybody says, no, I already know that stuff, then we'll move on. Uh, but if some of you are, are wanting me to do that, by all means, I will. So I'm looking for people to say, um, yes, I would like you to go over that material again. <laughs> if I don't see that, then we'll keep going. Okay, 
I got a couple of yeses there, so let's, let's go through that again. No problem. Okay, no worries. Uh, let's see, where is that? Okay, so what is a computer network? If, if you really don't know what a computer network is, let's talk about that. Actually, I need to go to the beginning of my animations here. Okay, so in the, in the very early days, right? So uh, in the early days of networking, which we're talking about like the, the mid, the early to mid 1970s, Networks were very primitive things. You know, remember, this is back before laptops existed. There were no such things as smartphones or tablets. So we had this idea, we had these big mainframe computers, these giant computers, and we needed these big mainframe computers to be able to exchange data with each other. So the very early networks just basically consisted of a physical cable connecting those devices together. So in a very high level, a computer network doesn't have to be this monstrously huge, complex, advanced thing. A computer network is as simple as some mechanism, some means to connect two devices together so those two devices can communicate. So those two devices can send information back and forth. In the early days, that mechanism was a physical cable those devices would tap into. And then more and more devices could tap into that cable. You might have three or five or 10 computers all tapped into one physical cable. Now what I mean by when I say tapped into a cable is you would have this one big thick cable. The cable didn't look anything like what we have today. It was a big thick cable, didn't bend very well. And it would go into the back of a, a computer where that computer, that big mainframe would tap into it. In other words, they have the sharp prong that would bite into the copper in the middle of the cable and then the cable would keep going. So these devices could all send and receive electrical energy across this one cable, and that was the network. So that's like what we have here. Here I have two different networks, Department A and Department B, and all their devices are connected to one physical cable. Now, as more and more devices need to connect to this network, there quickly became a problem. The problem was, well, okay, if I want to connect these two networks together, well, I could just take the two cables and connect them, so it's not just one big long string, one big long cable that everybody's connected to. But the, the longer that cable became, the more devices that were connected to it, the more problems started arising. For example, the network would get busier and busier. One networking device, one computer, might not be able to send anything because the cable was always busy. You know, one of the rules of these very early networks was only one person can talk at a time. After all, it's one cable, we're all sharing it. It's like a bunch of people in a room, right? With a common airspace used for talking. Well, if they all talk at the same time, no one can understand anything. So one of the rules was only one person can talk at a time. And if you want to talk, if you want to put something on the cable, but you detect electrical energy, you detect that somebody else is talking, you had to wait. So the more and more devices that were connected to this cable would result in more and more periods of waiting a lot of frustration where devices just couldn't get onto the cable because it was always busy. Um, and also there were certain restrictions about the length of the cable. The cable could only be so long, and if it was longer than the maximum length, then everything started breaking down. So there are all sorts of rules and protocols in place to where people said, you know what, this idea of everybody connecting to one physical cable, it's not gonna work anymore. It worked at the beginning when we had two or three or four devices, but now that we've got 40, 50, 100 devices, that's not working anymore. So they said some very smart people back in the, the mid to late 1970s, they said, hey, let's change our, our paradigm here, the way we think. Instead, why don't we have each device have its own separate independent cable, and all those independent cables will terminate in one central device. We'll create a networking device that can have a whole bunch of cables connected into it, and then electrical energy can go into this device, and this device can distribute those electrical signals, that data, to wherever it needs to go. And so those original devices were called hubs or repeaters, and then came out bridges, and then came out switches. 
So that's what we see right here. So now every device, every laptop PC has its own unique independent cable, which is terminating in this one central switch, I'll call it. Now at the same time, so here's our data network. So this, this, all these cables are being used to transfer data files, uh, like text files and stuff like that. Now, at the same time, we had a completely different network for our phones, our telephones. Uh, telephones had to be connected together. They had to be connected to a telephone switch, which would know how to route the calls from one number to another. And so that was a completely separate network. So we had offices that had a data network and a bunch of people that managed that and troubleshooted that and another network for voice. And then a couple of decades ago, some people said, hey, rather than owning and maintaining two completely separate networks, why don't we merge the two together? Why don't we create phones that can sit and connect to our data network? And the voice traffic can be carried on the exact same wires as the, as the data traffic. And so that's when voice over IP came about. If you ever hear that term voice over IP, that's what that's talking about. That's talking about let's create and use some special phones that connect to this existing data network so we don't have to have the expenses and the hassle of maintaining two completely different networks. Then some engineers had the idea of, hey, you know what? I pick up my laptop a lot. And in a wired network, that means I have to disconnect from my cube, the, the, the ethernet or the, the networking wire in my cube, carry my laptop over to the next office or the next floor and then connect it to an available wire on that floor. During which time I have no network connectivity as I'm walking from one room to the other, I've lost my networking connectivity because I'm not connected to a wire at all. And they said, you know, it'd be really nice if we could do away with that. If somebody could be sitting at their cube or somebody could be walking down the office, uh, you know, down the hallway or something, and still be connected to the network without the need for cables. And so then wireless networking came into play, which is otherwise known as Wi-Fi networking. So with Wi-Fi networking, you have a device such as a tablet or a smartphone or a laptop that has a radio inside of it. And now unlike the radio in your car, the radio in your car can only receive things, right? Now, if you're from 1980s, you're probably familiar with the, the the character MacGyver who can make anything out of anything. So, you know, there's probably a way to MacGyver the radio in your car. You know, if you were stranded somewhere in the ice fields of Alaska and you were an engineer, you might be able to figure out a way to dig into the radio in your car and figure out a way to transmit from that radio. Help, I'm stranded. But most people don't know how to do that. The radios in cars are really just designed to receive traffic, receive wireless signals. Well, the radios in here and your laptop are bidirectional. They're transmitting and receiving. They're called transceivers. If you ever hear that term transceiver, that's what you got in your smartphone. That's what you got in your tablet. It's a rail that's capable of doing transmitting and receiving. So on Wi-Fi networks, all the devices have a transceiver built into them and they can transmit and receive wirelessly. And then you probably want that wireless network connected back to your wired network. So we would then, you know, initiate some additional networking devices such as routers and other devices to do that. Now then the next evolution was this. So imagine my company is growing now and I've got hundreds of different departments. I've got a pretty large campus now. I've got a campus of like 10 different buildings um, spread across several acres of property and each building has six or seven floors on it and I've got hundreds of departments spread throughout my company and each department has information that's unique to that department. For example, payroll. Payroll has certain payroll files that they need access to of like, you know, salary information, bonus information, you know, whatever payroll needs. And so they've got a special computer called a server. And a server is like your laptop, except a server has a lot more resources. A server has a lot more memory. The, the processing power of a server is a lot more than your typical laptop or PC. So they've got a server and payroll has their own servers, got their payroll files on it. So payroll servers probably located where payroll sits. So the payrolls department is, you know, building five, third floor. So they got some servers over there for them. Now over here in building 10, I've got my marketing department. They've got their own servers. 
They have their marketing images, their marketing updates and stuff on it. So imagine now, I've got a, a large campus of like 10 or 11 buildings with hundreds of departments, and each department has, their, has one or more servers that they use to do their daily tasks. Now, I'm the networking person. I'm the IT staff. And for me, it's a huge headache when somebody calls me up and they say, I can't get to my data. I can't get to my files. I say, okay, well, where do you work? Oh, I work in payroll. Okay, so now I've got to track down, okay, what files are you trying to get? Because I know payroll's got like six payroll servers. Each server has different stuff on it. And so I have to ask them, okay, what kind of file are you not able to get to? And I have to look at my spreadsheet. Okay, the file they're trying to get to is on payroll server number three. Okay, where the heck is payroll server number three? Oh, it's in building five, third floor, over here in this corner. So if I'm trying to troubleshoot stuff, I got servers spread out all over the place in my network. And so some people said, you know what? It'd probably make a lot more sense to take all those servers and put them all in one central location. Let's reserve a particular floor of one particular building, put all my servers there, make that, that floor very secure. You know, you have to have a special badge to get into it. Let's put in special air conditioning in there because now that floor has got hundreds of servers on it, which are pumping out a lot of heat. I need special air conditioning to keep that particular room very cool. And that room is what's called a data center. So if you hear that term data center, a data center is basically just this idea of one central point, one location in my company where all my servers, all my mission critical data is located right there, rather than having it spread out all over the place. And there's a lot of benefits to having it all in one location. And of course, we need our network to extend to the data center so we can get to that information, we can get to those files. And then lastly, we're going to want our company to be able to have an internet presence. We want the world to be able to reach our web servers so they can find out who we are, so they can order and purchase our product. And we want to be able to get out to the internet. Our employees want to be able to, you know, uh, browse the websites of other companies. So now we're going to need our, to connect our network to the internet, to an internet service provider to give them that connectivity. So that is a computer network starting at something very small, which is just one cable that a couple of devices are connected to. And then we can see how it could scale out to something much larger than that with all these different pieces and components to it. So let's talk about some common vocabulary, LANs versus WANs. So a LAN stands for a local area network. A local area network is defined as a network that's fairly small in size. So LAN could be something as small as the network you have at your house. Maybe your house, all you've got is your laptop connected to a, a cable modem or a DSL modem and that's it. That's a LAN. That is a local area network. A LAN could be much bigger. It could be a LAN could be a, a network owned by a company. Like in my example, I've got a campus with like 10 buildings. Well, that's all connected by a LAN. All those buildings, all the wires are connected to a LAN. Another aspect of a LAN another characteristic is that typically all the components of a local area network are owned, installed, managed, and configured by you. So if you are the IT staff, if you're the network administrator, all the cables, all the devices that compose that network were purchased by you, installed by you, and if something breaks, it's up to you to figure that out. So that is a local area network. Now what is a WAN? A WAN is a wide area network. A WAN is used to connect two or more local area networks together when they're fairly far apart geographically. For example, if I have an office in Raleigh, North Carolina, if I've got a LAN there that I own and maintain, and my company also has another office in New York City, New York, and I've got a LAN there, I want those two LANs to be able to talk to each other, to be able to send and receive data. Well, number one, I don't have a cable that I don't have enough money to buy six or 700 miles worth of cabling to connect that one LAN to the other. I don't have the money to pay the construction staff to dig the, the trench under the earth for 600 miles to lay that cable. And even if I did have the money, even if I was a, a multi-billion dollar corporation, I probably would not be able to get the governmental permits to lay that cable and to dig those trenches and do all that stuff. So if I want to connect those two LANs together, I have to go to a service provider. I have to go to a WAN service provider. 
A WAN service provider like Time Warner Cable or Verizon or Sprint or whoever is a company that's already done that. That's a company that's already laid hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles of cabling. They've already gotten the government permits. They've already dug the trenches. They've got a, a network in place that is hundreds or thousands of miles long. And that's called your wide area network. So you, who's in control of your local area network, you would pay them so you can connect your local area network to their wide area network. As a matter of fact, let's just bring it back to your home network, right? Your home network at your house, you've got some cable modem or DSL modem that uh, you may have bought it, or maybe you're renting it from Time Warner Cable or from Comcast. Either way, that cable modem, that DSL modem is connecting to a WAN. It's connecting to a wide area network, to a cable network, or a DSL network, or maybe these days to a fiber optic network from like AT&T or something like that. Some other terms here, node or host. So a node is any physical device that's connected to a network. All right? Your laptop, when it's connected to a network, is a node. A router or a switch that's connected to a network is a node. Anything that's basically not a cable, a physical device that has a physical box that's connected to a network is considered a node. Now what's a host? A host is typically, it, it's, it's a node, it's another example of a node, but what makes a host a little bit different or more specific than a node is that a host is an end device connected to a network. In other words, a device is either generating data and pushing that data through the network or it has made a request for data and data is coming and terminating at that device. For example, your laptop is a host. Your tablet is a host. Your PC is a host. Those are all device examples of host devices. A router or a switch, we wouldn't typically call those host devices because a router or a switch, data is passing through it. It's facilitating the transmission or forwarding of data but a router or switch is not necessarily generating the data. It's not the end point where the data is going to that device and stopping, or that device is generating the data and then sending it out. So we wouldn't really call a router or a switch a host device. They are nodes, but they are not hosts. Then we also have this concept of local versus remote resources. So what's that? So a local resource is something on your computing device that you can access, that you can use without any networking connectivity whatsoever. Like if I go to my, my iPad right here and I disable the Wi-Fi, there's no networking on this thing at all. I still have some local resources on here. For example, I have memory on here. I have a graphics adapter on here which can allow me to display things. I've got uh, some sort of brain, some central processing unit on this thing, those are all examples of local resources. On your laptop, you've got a hard drive. You've got a DVD-ROM drive. Those are all local resources. You don't need network connectivity to use that stuff. A remote resource is just the opposite. A remote resource is something that can give you data, give you files, but it's not connected to you. You need the network to get to that device. For example, when you go to google.com, the web server, well, there's some server, some physical box somewhere that's hosting the website of Google.com. But unless you're connected to the network, you can't get to that device. It's remote. It's not locally on your own machine. And then, of course, what is the Internet? Um, you know, if, if you're not familiar with what that term is, let me just briefly define that. The Internet is just basically a collection of millions and millions of local area networks, LANs, they're all connected together. They're all interconnected. So right now, you are part of the internet. The fact that you're watching me, that you're able to hear me, that you're able to get information from me means you are a LAN that's connected via a WAN to millions and millions of other LANs. That is the internet. So just the last thing I want to talk about is why do we need computer networks? You know, what, what benefit do they bring to our lives? Well, computer networks obviously allow us to share things. They allow us to share files, for example, text files, documents, spreadsheets. You know, you can send it from one device to another because you've got a network. They allow us to share programs. 
right? Whenever you go onto your tablet or onto your smartphone and you download a new app, like a music app or a game or some productivity software, you wouldn't be able to do that if you weren't connected to a network. And then lastly, networks allow us to share resources like network printers. So I can have one printer in the office that everybody can connect to to print stuff instead of having every laptop or PC having its own printer directly connected to it. A network allows us to share resources like that. So that brings us up to the Q&A. So we're back to where we were before. Now, hopefully all of that stuff <laughs> made it through this time. Somebody asks, are the switches different for wireless firewalls and voice over IP? Um, they can be or they can be the same. Uh, a lot of times the switches are the same. You will, you will get one switch and that one switch will be carrying your voice traffic through it. It will also be carrying your data traffic through it and your Wi-Fi traffic. So, for example, you know, my tablet here, when I connect to the Wi-Fi, I'm wirelessly connecting to another device, which is on the ceiling. I can see it over there, which is called a wireless access point. So the wireless transmission is between my laptop and that wireless device, that access point. But on the other side of that access point, that access point has a cable coming out of it. And that cable is connecting to a switch, the exact same switch that people's laptops are connected to, that their IP phones are connected to. So a lot of times one switch will serve the functionality of interconnecting all these disparate networks together. Does anybody else have any other questions on uh, what we just talked about there? All right, and let me just do a quick check here. Just want to make sure. Is the voice and video still coming through okay? Can you guys still see and hear me all right? Great. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Eric. Okay, is it live or is it Memorex? Exactly, exactly. Um, Tariq, you ask a good question. What's the difference between a man and a WAN? It's, uh, so a MAN stands for a, um, a metropolitan area network. And a, a MAN and a WAN, they share a lot of the same characteristics. Um, Usually, I just define a man and a WAN as being different based on geography. Um, for example, a, a service provider that creates a bunch of cabling that encircles a city, like let's say the city of Boston, Massachusetts, okay? Fairly large city, you know, from, from end to end. We're probably not talking about hundreds of miles, but we're talking about, you know, dozens of miles, maybe 40 or 50 miles end to end from one suburb of Boston to another suburb of Boston. So it's, it's still pretty large, but a network that's laid out that runs throughout the city of Boston, that would be really considered a metropolitan area network. It's definitely bigger than a local area network, um, but when I'm thinking of a wide area network, I'm thinking of something that stretches for hundreds or maybe thousands of miles. Although the, the lines get sort of grayed and blurred between where a, a man ends and where a WAN begins. Uh, Money Noop One, <laughs> I'm not really sure of your, your question there. You say, why can't you ARP on an access switch, but only on a distribution or core switch? Uh, for those of you who are uh, familiar with the concept of an ARP, uh, an ARP is basically a, a type of message that a host, like a laptop, a PC, a server, would send in order to discover the presence of another host. 
That's a real high level definition of it. But an ARP is a special type of a message that goes across a network. When one device is saying, hey, device number two, I know you're out there, but I need a little bit more information about you so I can actually send information to you. That's an ARP. It's called address resolution protocol. You're trying to resolve the address of another networking device that's on the same LAN as you are. Well, when an ARP message goes out, a switch will have to forward that ARP message. And whether the switch is at the access, the core, or the distribution level doesn't really matter. Um, and I'm not going to go into what the differences are between access, core, and distribution. That's more in depth for CCNA. That really depends on, you know, access, core, and distribution is really talking about where a switch is located in the network. You know, how deep into the network is it located. But regardless of where a switch is physically located, if it receives an ARP message, it should forward that ARP message. It shouldn't really matter whether it's access, core, or distribution. Do companies use switches operating in cut-through mode rather than store in forward mode, or is it something that actually isn't used that much? Um, so Felipe, just to, to answer that question, so when a host device, like a laptop or a PC, puts information out onto the network, what you can really visualize that as is that when you, let's take something like an email, okay? So I'm, I'm creating an email and I press send. So what's actually really happening under the hood? So from my perspective on my screen, that email is a bunch of letters, right? Formed into words and spaces and things. But when it actually goes onto the network, what happens is the brain of my laptop converts those letters and symbols into ones and zeros, into what's called binary digits, ones and zeros. So like 10111 might represent an A, 00011 might represent a B. So everything I typed on my keyboard, every image in that email is converted into a number of ones and zeros. It's like a digital code of ones and zeros representing everything. And in order to get that code onto the network, if I'm talking about a wired network, then we're talking about taking those ones and zeros and converting them into electrical energy. And an analogy I like to use is, you know, think of, I've got a couple of batteries. I got a little nine volt battery and I put that out to my tongue, zip, right? I get a little electrical charge, all right? That electrical charge, that the power of that, that zolt, that voltage, that zip I just got might represent a one. Whereas now if I've got a big car battery, I put that up to my tongue. Well, you know, after I take my head and pick it up off the floor, that different voltage, that different charge, much different, that might represent a zero. So in a computer network, we've got these different electrical signals going down the wire. Some, you know, represent ones, some represent zeros. And so you've got this idea of electrical energy going down, a, going down a wire. So what is this thing called a frame? A frame is basically a series of ones and zeros represented by electrical energy. So frame is, okay, a frame is composed of the very first electrical charge, which is some one or zero. You've got thousands or maybe, you know, tens of thousands of ones or zeros, and then it's done. And that series of ones and zeros, that series of electrical energy that you've sent down the wire might represent the first one quarter of your email, the, right? The first paragraph of letters and digits that you typed in. So that is called a frame. Um, So to answer the question of cut through mode or store and forward mode, um, store and forward means that that entire frame, all that electrical energy that was consisting of, you know, thousands of ones and zeros, store and forward means when it gets to a switch, a networking device, the networking device takes the whole thing in, takes the whole thing into memory from the first electrical signal, which was maybe a one, to the last electrical signal, which was a zero, takes the whole thing in, and then once it takes it in, store and forward means, okay, now I've stored it, now I'm going to forward it. I'm going to figure out of all the places, of all the cables this could go, which cable I'm going to forward it out onto. That's store and forward. Cut through is this idea of, okay, as the electrical energy starts coming into the switch, we might not need to see all 10,000 bits in order to figure out where this thing needs to go. Cut through means the switch says, okay, I've collected the first few hundred bits. I know there's still more coming, 
but the first few hundred bits are enough for me to decide which cable to forward this thing out on. So in cut through mode, the switch will say, okay, now I can start cutting it through. It's coming in off of one cable and it's still coming in on this one cable, but now I'm sending it out on this other cable, even though I haven't gotten to the end of the frame yet. Most switches do store and forward mode. Uh, there's not a lot of switches that do cut through mode anymore. Most switches do store and forward because once the switch is able to take in the entire frame, it can look at all of it from end to end and it can make a whole bunch of decisions. Not only decisions about where does this thing go, but decisions about security decisions. You know, maybe this portion of the frame right here will tell me I need to drop it. It breaks a security restriction and other types of decisions as well that could not be made if you didn't have the whole thing to look at and make your decisions. All right, uh, what other questions do we have here? So you bought the CCNA bundle for, C, uh, the INE bundle for CCNA, uh, Ahmad, and you're facing really big problems in subnetting. Is there any advice? Okay, uh, well, if you are, if you watch the CCNA videos, and you're still facing some problems with subnetting, what can you do? Um, well, there's a whole bunch of stuff. So let me go back to this. Now, I'm not in sales, so I don't know what we sell as standalone products. I don't know what comes with bundles. So I'm just gonna point out some resources that I know about. If you go to streaming, let me go ahead and bring this in here so you can see it. And I'll full screen it so you can see it completely. If you go to streaming.ine.com, this is where you can see everything that we have. And from right here, if you type in IP address, hmm, this is up right now. Okay. Uh, anyway, let's see here. IP addressing, well, it's not the CCNA boot camp. Where is it? How about IP subnet? What I'm looking for, I might just have to scroll through here actually. I did an entire series above and beyond what was in the CCNA videos just on IP addressing and subnetting. It was like three or four hours of, of just that. We probably have to scroll through this, but if you, you, can, you can all access this. You don't even have to have an, an INE account. Just go to streaming.ine.com. And if you scroll through here, you should see somewhere in here like a, a three or four hour course just on IP addressing and subnetting. Um, so if that came as part of your bundle, that's a great thing to look at. That goes into all the gory detail you'll ever need about that. Um, if, you, if that's not available to you, there's a lot of other videos available on YouTube, a lot of other uh, documents available on IP addressing and subnetting. I would just recommend searching there and, and doing some practice. All right, we still have some significant stuff to go through. Uh, and as much as I would love to answer your questions about DHCP and proxy ARP and all this stuff, we could be here all day going through that stuff. So keeping in mind that, that I, I'm trying to focus this on somebody who knows nothing about networking, I'm gonna go ahead and, and keep on going for the purposes of time here into the next section. And then we'll take a break after that because I'll need a break. I don't know about you guys. All right, so in this next section, I'm gonna talk about the components of computer networks. Once again, this is more just like defining terminology uh, for those of you who don't know what these terms mean. So let's start with this idea of servers and clients in the event that you're not familiar with this stuff. Let's 
So in so most of what we do today um, on our laptops and PCs and tablets really requires us pulling data down from another device. In other words, like I said, you when you think about computer networking, you've got you've got two things here. Let me just go ahead and bring up my my tablet. Okay, so I know you can't see this, but you know on any tablet, on any smartphone, you got tons and tons of icons on here. Some of these icons let you do stuff even if you're not connected to a network at all. For example, play music, um, open up a spreadsheet maybe and, and work on that, you know, take photographs. Okay, so once again, that is what we call a local resource from earlier before. Other things on here will only work if you have a network connection. So for those particular programs, we're now talking about something called a server-client relationship, meaning that my device, my tablet, is the client, and it's trying to pull some information from a remote resource called a server. So like what we see right here, a client is typically any end device that's making a request, that's saying, hey, I need to get some information. So for example, your laptops, your tablets, your smartphones, those would all be examples of clients. An end device that does not have information and is trying to get that information, trying to get a website, trying to get a music file, trying to download a movie. Now where does it get that from? Well, all those devices have to connect to the network and where are they asking for? Well, they're asking for it from a server. Now this picture right here, I'll go ahead and zoom in on this. This is actually showing you like a data center. This, this is considered a cage or a rack. And each one of these devices in here, each one of these is an individual server. So each one of these rectangular things right here is a server. So this one right here might be a server that's hosting a bunch of websites. Maybe this represents INE server. And you've got INE's main INE.com website, you've got the, the store.INE.com, you've got streaming.INE.com. So this has got the information that you want. So a client is going to be requesting information from a server. When you go to any website, google.com, cnn.com, foxnews.com, you are the client and you are going to a server to get information. Uh, we've already talked a lot about this, just once again defining local and remote resources. I don't think we need to go into this in any greater detail. In this case, instead of remote resources, we're calling them networked resources. For example, networked hard disk drive, that's what HDD stands for, hard disk drive, network printers. All right. Now, in order to connect to a network, you have to have some component that will connect or interface your computer, your laptop, with the network. And that's what we call a network interface card. And network interface cards come in many different forms. So for example, when we're talking about connecting to a wired network. Well, the most common type of networking wire is called Ethernet wire. And it typically looks like this right here. Let me bring this up here. So this is an example of Ethernet wire. Now you might be wondering, well, what does that term Ethernet mean? So if I showed you just a piece of cable and I said, okay, this piece of cable is what you're going to physically connect to to connect to the network. Well, there's still a lot of questions that have to be answered to use that cable. For example, okay, just because I stick that cable into my laptop or PC, I have to answer questions such as, okay, well, can my laptop or PC 
transmit information onto that cable whenever it wants to? Or are there certain rules it has to follow as far as transmitting information? For example, one type of networking language might say, okay, for this wire, yes, you can transmit whenever you want to. That's just, that's the rule. Another networking language or protocol might say, no, this wire is actually being shared among lots of other devices. So before you transmit something, you have to listen to the wire. If somebody else is talking, you have to wait until they're done, and then you can transmit. So what we're talking about here are networking protocols. You know, what's a protocol? A protocol is a rule, right? If I go to a, a foreign country, I might say, what are the protocols here in this country? You know, how am I supposed to bow? How am I supposed to shake hands? Is there a protocol to meet someone's eyes or not to look at them in the eye? You know, what, what's the protocol here? Well, there's networking protocols. Networking protocols are, what are the rules for accessing the network? So Ethernet is a protocol. When we talk about Ethernet, we're saying Ethernet is a set of rules for using a certain type of cable to access a certain network. So for example, um, one of the rules of Ethernet says, okay, Ethernet has different types of connectors. So if I'm connecting to an Ethernet network, I have to know what type of connector goes on the end of my cable. This is a very common connector right here. This is called an RJ45 connector. RJ stands for registered jack. Somebody actually has a specification. The RJ specification says that, okay, this jack has to only be a certain width. There's a certain number of wires inside that jack. Those wires should have certain colors on them. They should be a certain thickness. All that is within the RJ45 specification. And the designers of Ethernet decided, okay, this is one type of connector we can use. Ethernet says an RJ45 connector is, a, is an authorized, approved connector for connecting to an Ethernet cable. So your network interface card, if your network interface card is connecting to an Ethernet network, well, the Ethernet network has rules and protocols. So your network interface card knows, okay, well, I need to have an RJ45 connector so I can connect to this type of cable. This network interface card knows the rules of Ethernet. It knows when it's allowed to transmit, when it can't transmit, when something's coming in, when electrical energy is coming in off the Ethernet wire. An Ethernet network interface card knows, is that for me or is it for somebody else? Is it actually valid ones and zeros or is it just meaningless electrical garbage? Ethernet NIC cards can answer those questions. So here we see um, on a laptop, you don't really see the NIC card. You see the connector, right? You see right there the jack for the RJ45 cable to plug into, but the actual NIC card is under the case. It's under the hood of your laptop. You don't really see it. Um, in a PC or a server, this is what your Ethernet NIC card might look like, right? Most of this, this part right here, you don't see it plugs in to the server or the PC. And so all you really see is this connector right here. Right here, here we have an RG45 jack. And there's some sort of network interface card behind that that we don't see. So the network interface card is the fundamental connector to give you access to the network. Now network interface cards aren't always gonna connect to ethernet networks. There's other types of networks that have other rules about how you connect, what electrical levels should be used for ones and zeros, when you can transmit, when you can't. For example, here's another example of one. Some networks use different wires which are called coaxial cables. For example, uh, your coaxial cables is, is going to your, your cable box at home, right? So you've got some, some cable box sitting in your living room and that's connected to the cable network and that's what's giving you your various cable TV stations and you're able to record that and stuff. Well, that's a totally different type of cable and the, the rules and the protocols that are going across that cable are totally different than ethernet. It's a totally different rule set. So we need a network interface card that can connect to that type of cable that understands those types of rules. So even though we don't see it, there is some sort of network interface card right here 
in the back of this box. And this is the connector here, but even behind this, the whole network interface card is behind there, connecting to a coaxial cable. We also have network interface cards for connecting to our Wi-Fi net networks, right? We have to have some, you know, Wi-Fi also has its own set of rules, its own protocols about when you can transmit wirelessly, when you can't. When you hear something coming wireless, how to determine, is that for me? or is that for somebody else's network interface card? So here's some examples of what network interface cards look like for Wi-Fi. So if you hear this term, if somebody says, okay, well, you're telling me you, you can't get on the network, you're not getting anything. Have you checked your NIC? Is your NIC operational? This is what they're talking about. They're saying, okay, you know, if you're on a wired network, where does the wire terminate in your laptop? Wherever that wire is sticking into, plugging into, that is your wired network interface card. If you don't have any wire connected to it at all, maybe that's why you don't have any network connectivity. If you're talking about a Wi-Fi network, then you've got some, some NIC that's connected to that. Is that NIC operational? So we have our hosts here. Every single host has some sort of network interface card, either wireless or wired, which connects to a wire. And then eventually that's going to lead us back to most likely our first networking device, which is our switch. So just like when I very first was describing this concept of what is a network, and I said, well, we've got all these different cables, every single laptop, every single PC has its own unique independent cable, which is all terminating in some central device. That device is most likely a switch. So when we look at our switch right here, if I zoom in on this, So each one of these things here is an RJ45 connection that the cable's plugged into. There's a cable plugged into here, plugged into here. So switches can be quite small, like right here. We've got an eight port switch. Each one of these things is called a port. And I could have eight cables plugged into that. Or I could have a really huge switch, like this is a Nexus switch right here. This is a special switch sold by Cisco. And it could have literally hundreds of cables plugged into it. And of course, the bigger the switch, the more connectors it has, the more expensive it's going to be. Now, a network could be composed of just a bunch of hosts connected to a switch, right? We could have a very simple network looking like this. I've got three hosts. I've got a switch in the middle. I'll make a box right here, and they're connected to that. That is a very simple network. I've got three hosts, and these hosts right here have some network interface cards. I'll just draw like a little circle right there. They're connected to a cable, and that cable is connected to a switch. Now, as networks grow and grow and grow, and we start having dozens or even hundreds of hosts, we could have switches capable of that, like this switch right here, could have hundreds of hosts connected to it. But if all the hosts are connected to the same switch, we start having problems from like maybe a security perspective. I don't want everything seeing everything. I don't want every host seeing all the electrical signals of every other host. I want to start dividing my network up and implementing some other devices to give me some security. And so that's where we might have routers implemented. Another common use of a router is when I have different types of networks that need to talk to each other. For example, maybe I've got one network that has some Ethernet cables into it, but that network needs to connect to another network that has fiber optic cables that use light signals. Instead of electrical energy, it uses light to represent ones and zeros. Or maybe I've got uh, one network that uses cables, but the protocol is not Ethernet. It uses something completely different than Ethernet. And I need to connect all these different kinds of networks together. That's another use of a router. A router allows you to connect different types of networks that speak different languages all together. And so we would use a router for that. Routers also have a lot of security features in them that switches don't. Uh, so that's another benefit of using routers. And then, of course, for your Wi-Fi networks. 
common components of Wi-Fi's are Wi-Fi access points. So you've got your Wi-Fi NIC inside your, your tablet or inside your smartphone or inside your laptop. What is that Wi-Fi NIC talking to? It's talking to this. It's talking to an access point. Now, you might not see the access point. A lot of times access points are put above the ceiling tiles in a lot of companies because they don't want you to see where the access point is because if you can see it, you might be able to damage it or do something against that if you've got some evil or malicious intent. Whereas if it's hidden behind a ceiling tile or if it's hidden behind the wall, you don't see it. But the access point is what's connecting to your Wi-Fi signal. And then the access point in turn will have a wire coming off the back of it, which will then connect to a switch. So those are some common components you'll find in every single network. Cables, NIC cards, switches, routers, and Wi-Fi access points. So do you have any questions on that particular section? All right, let me scroll up here a little bit. Glad you guys are talking about uh, the INE rack rentals and the workbooks. Yeah, our, our rack rentals, I think, are a great resource. Um, so for those of you who are watching, who as we go along, start thinking to yourself, you know what? This sounds pretty interesting, this concept of, of routers and switches and networking protocols, I, I want to learn more about it. And maybe eventually, I want to get to the point where I actually start getting some practice with routers and switches. I want to see how do you control these things? How do you make them do this? Um, so, you know, i &E has rack rentals where you can actually rent our routers and switches to practice on them. Any other questions I can answer? All right, I'll tell you what, uh, we've been going now for about an hour and 45 minutes, and I don't know about you, but I need a quick break. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just put us on a timer here for about 15 minutes or so, uh, so we can have a break. Somebody asked, can I have two routers on one network? Absolutely. You can have hundreds of routers on a network. Now, typically on... I'll just leave it with that. <laughs> yes, you can have many routers on a network. So what is an example of a lab for these routers and switches? So let me bring something up here for a moment. So when you start preparing for Cisco certifications, let's say you say, okay, I want to get into this field of networking and I want to start, I want to get a job in that. Well, one of the most common ways to do that is to get a certification, pass a test, that proves you know something about networking. And lots of different vendors offer certifications that prove this. Juniper does, certainly Cisco does, and, and Cisco certifications are, are probably the most well-known. So the certification you're probably going to start with will be the CCNA which stands for the Cisco Certified Networking Associate. The CCN is sort of like their, their foundational baseline certification. And at the CCNA level, you're expected to know how to get in and install and operate smaller size networks. Smaller size networks being anywhere from like, you know, one to probably uh, 10 switches. And, you know, maybe one to 10 routers. And so you're going to have to know how to sort of put a network together that might look like this. Maybe you have a switch, let's just say three switches, switch one, switch two, switch three. You'll have to know how to cable those switches together so they can talk to each other, so they can forward information. Uh, you'll have to know how to implement 
routers into your network. So maybe I've got a router right here, router one, router two, router three, and router four. And routers are typically represented by circles that look like hockey pucks. And you'll have to know how to connect those together. And so you might look at that, you might say, okay, but you know, do I actually have to go out and buy my own routers, my own switches, buy the cables, connect this stuff up so I can learn how they work, so I can learn how to control them and configure them. And that's where rack rentals come into play. So if you go, if you go, I won't spend a lot of time on this, um, but if you go to our website, let me bring that up right here. If you go to INE.com, Okay, and you click on training solutions. Let me expand this a little bit and scroll down to rack rentals. So with INE, we've got lots of different racks available. We have racks available for people who are preparing for their CCNA. Racks are fairly small. They just consist of like three switches and four routers. And then we have racks for the more advanced specialty certifications that have hundreds of routers and hundreds of switches in them. So how you get on these racks is you first, you purchase these things called tokens. Um, and the, the least amount of tokens you can purchase is 100. You can go much larger than that. And then once you purchase some tokens, you would select a rack. So for example, if I go to members.ine.com, and I log in. Uh, <laughs> let's see if I remember my password here for this. Oh boy, what is it? I don't know if that's the right one. Oh good, I got lucky. Okay. Um, so if you go to, just move this over here for a second. So from members, if you up at the top there, if you click on rack rentals, let me just put this back here. You can see these are all the different types of racks we have. We have racks for CCIE routing and switching. We have CCIE collaboration security. These are all different racks of different quantities of routers and switches and other specialized equipment. So for example, if you want to practice just basic CCNA stuff, you might want to schedule some time on the CCNA racks. You can see there are three tokens per hour, so that's why you have to purchase the tokens in advance, and for every hour you'd be using three of these things. And this particular rack, once you schedule it for an hour or more, it's up to you, you get access to this. Four routers and three switches are already pre-cabled for you, and you can get into those and you can practice doing things. You can, you know, so as you're reading a book and you're learning about a particular technology and the book says, okay, when you get into a switch, here's the commands that you type in to make this technology work. Well, now rather than buying your own switch, you can rent time on this, get into this switch and for like an hour, type in those commands and practice them and see if they work. So that's what INE racks are. All right, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and put us up onto a break for a little bit of time, and then I'll come back when the break is done. All right, I'll see you guys after the break.
around you who have varying degrees of networking experience, who you can bounce ideas off of, and who can give you some ideas as to how this stuff is used in the real world in their own networks. So what can you expect by attending one of our boot camps? Well, certainly you can expect long days. There is a reason why we call these boot camps. The Cisco CCNA covers a lot of material. And so in order to learn this stuff, we're gonna have long, grueling days. So be prepared for that. Be prepared to be dedicated to this experience should you hopefully choose to go. You'll have lectures and lab demonstrations. The instructor's not just gonna sit up there for eight or 10 hours hitting you with one PowerPoint after the other. In order to reinforce the material, you're gonna have frequent whiteboarding, frequent verbal explanations of how this stuff is used in the real world, and lab demonstrations so you can, you can actually see how to configure, monitor, and troubleshoot this on real equipment. You'll also have equipment of your own, so if you choose to do so, you can follow along with the instructor's lab demonstrations. And you'll have do-it-yourself labs. Now this is the type of lab or term I've coined that means once the instructor has taught you a particular topic, that person might put some lab objectives up on a slide or bullet point. Real high level objectives, configure this protocol, make it talk this way with this device. And the idea is you have a certain amount of time to try to make it work on your own, to see if you've actually learned the material and can incorporate it into your own lab. And then of course, at the end of the time, the instructor will go through that lab and show you how to complete it. You can also expect verbal quizzing during the lab. This is the one of many tools the instructor has to do testing for understanding. The instructor will frequently ask individuals within the class questions pertaining to what has just been taught or maybe things that were taught hours or days before just to make sure that you're actually retaining the knowledge. So what are some of our prerequisites to attend a CCNA boot camp? This boot camp is not designed for someone who has no networking experience at all. We do expect that you will have done some self-study prior to attending this boot camp to get the most out of this experience. The ideal candidate before attending our CCNA routing and switching boot camp will have spent a minimum of two to three months in their own self studies. Now in order to help guide you further, if you go to streaming.ine.com, our website, and from there, click on Cisco, CCENT, you'll see that the very first topic is called Operation of IP Data Networks. That consists of about three hours of videos that fall under that general umbrella. So ideally you would watch those three hours before attending our boot camp, or get a similar level of knowledge via your own self-studies of reading, white papers, or wherever you go to do your self-studies. So with that, hopefully I've answered your questions, I've whetted your appetite to attend our boot camp, and I will see you there.
you know, I, I think that when I first started that there was, uh, you know, I had a perception that I knew a lot about the basic, the core protocols. And now, um, you know, I realized I didn't when I first started. And this has really filled in those gaps. Just getting in there, labbing the stuff, um, seeing the problems, correcting the problems. I've never seen anything out there like this. And I've been to multiple Cisco uh, courses for my CCMP, CCNA. But this, you actually get to see the technology work. So it kind of helps stick it in your brain. Our sessions are very interactive. Uh, always available to answer any questions during the session or offline. They give you, he like, gives you the right mentality you need to approach any problem or troubleshoot or, you know, answer a question on a test. Uh, it's helped me a lot. You know, even even stuff that's not even for the CCIE. You know, I had the all access pass. Just the knowledge that you get from them. You know, not only like you know this is how you configure it, but they actually show you in the video this is how it works. And that's what you need. You can't just read a document and be like, well, this is a configuration. So hopefully it works, because sometimes it doesn't work. I wish that I'd start off with material just like this, because I would have understood right off the bat what the theory is and, and what it's actually doing in the command line. It's definitely more advanced. I think it's explained in a better way, better analogies. Uh, I think it's tougher, which is good. You know, I, I took one that was earlier, and it was uh, it was easier, you know what I mean? So it gave me this, this um, false confidence. And so now you're getting into this stuff and you see like, wow, this is a little bit more advanced. <laughs> so, you know, I want to do, do some more of this stuff and now it's starting, I'm starting to feel way more comfortable. A few of the weak spots that I had, I'm able to get over those things and understand those things better. It's easy to study for a test and just study exactly what you need to know, but in this class we've gone kind of above and beyond and he showed us things that can actually apply in real world and some things that may not be applicable to the exam, but are good things to know, especially when troubleshooting. And I, I definitely recommend it. Um, I've been recommending it. Uh, just using the materials, now going to the camp, I'd recommend it all day long. It's just a, it's a completely different learning experience.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, so let's continue on here and start talking. So now we're going to move sort of away from the devices or components that you'll find in a computer network. And now we'll start talking a little bit at a real high level about the technologies that comprise a network. And these are the ones I'm going to focus on. So by the time we're done with this section here, you'll have a good idea what each one of these terms stands for. So with that in mind, um, I'm just going to use this white space here in the slide to start drawing some stuff. So let's imagine that we have a couple of PCs right here and we know that they um, each have their own cable and on the PC, do you remember what was the term of the component of the PC that that cable terminates at? In other words, you plug your cable into the blank of the PC. Fill in the blank. That was the NIC, the network interface cards. So these little green circles here will represent the network interface card connecting the cable. And then that cable terminates at a switch. So I'll put a switch right here. Let's say that's switch one. And then maybe as our network grows, we put some additional switches in there. And in order to uh, connect us to other parts of the network that use maybe different protocols, so we can't connect via switch, um, because we need something that connects from one protocol to another, like from Ethernet to something else, or maybe other parts of the network that we want to have some security restrictions on, we're going to go ahead and put a router in here as well. So let's just say this is a router. It's connecting right there. And that router might connect to other routers. And each one of these clouds I'm going to draw right here, connecting to the routers, represents other local area networks. Local area networks within my company. Okay, just maybe different floors, different buildings, so on and so forth. Okay, so what is, let's start out with what is routing and switching. So the technologies of routing and switching are, you know, when we implement, for example, switches and routers into our network, there's going to be certain protocols that they run, certain languages that they speak that allow them to learn about the network, that allow them to learn about the different paths through the network, that allow them to learn what the best path is through a given network. For example, when one PC, for example, this PC right here, sends information into this switch, how does the switch know where the information goes? There's a switching protocol that determines that. If I want to implement some security on the switch that says, okay, well, when this PC here sends some data, maybe certain type of data is allowed through the switch. Other type of data is not allowed through the switch because it breaks our network policy. That's another thing that switching technologies would allow you to learn. Other switching technology says, okay, well, if a particular link fails, like this one goes down right here, how is switch one going to learn about a backup link? And how quickly is it going to switch over to a backup link? So switching is all about that managing these switches, configuring these switches, implementing features and protocols on the switches to optimize them and make them run as efficiently as possible. Routing is the same thing, but routing is for routers, right? Routing is configuring the router so that they are aware of all the different paths in the network. For example, when something gets over here to router one, some data, and maybe that data is destined for right here. So I'll just put right here, this is the destination. How is router one aware 
of this land. It's not physically connected to it. So how does it know where this land is? And of these three different interfaces that it has, how does it know which interface will get it to that land? Or in some cases, more than one interface will get it there. For example, if that data gets down here to router two, router two might say, okay, well, I'm aware of this, this destination local area network, but I have three possible interfaces that could all get me there. Which one is the best? Which one will get me there the fastest? So the realms of routing and switching is all about learning how to configure routers and switches to know what the network looks like, where the different local area networks reside, and how to get the data through the network in the most efficient way possible. So that's at a real high level, the technologies of routing and switching. Now what's data center? I mentioned that as your network grows, you might decide that a certain part of your network, like maybe here, some room, is going to be set aside as your data center. And this is a room where you're going to put all of your servers. I'll just do a few of them right now. Let's say these boxes all represent web servers and email servers and file servers and all sorts of stuff. Well, there's a whole specialty in networking that's designed around data center networking. In other words, how do we connect these servers to the network? Now, you might think, well, don't you just connect the servers to the network the same way you connect the PC to the network? I mean, don't they have NIC cards? Yes, they do. But a lot of times, the NIC cards that you'll find on a PC aren't necessarily suitable for connecting to a server. For example, in this data center, you know, if, if your laptop or PC loses network connectivity, let's say your NIC card is not that reliable and, you know, maybe once a month you lose network connectivity for five minutes. Well, for you, as the user of that PC, that's a little bit irritating, that's annoying that you don't have network, but it's not going to kill the company. But if a server loses network connectivity for five minutes, especially if that's a server where people are going to do e-commerce and purchase products from your company, that could translate to thousands or sometimes even millions of lost revenue dollars if that server goes down. So one of the things that makes connecting to a network in a data center very different than connecting to a network in a normal LAN where hosts reside is that the data center network has to be much, much more reliable. It uses special types of NIC cards, special types of technologies that are much more reliable um, and that can handle much greater quantities of data. I mean, for once again, one of these servers could be receiving and sending information to hundreds or thousands of clients in a very short amount of time. So the network it connects to not only has to be super reliable and super efficient, it has to be able to handle massive quantities of data. So data center networking is about knowing those specialties. What specialized types of routers and switches fit inside a data center that will give us that really super reliability we're talking about. That will give us the really fast speeds we're talking about. And there's lots of other features and protocols that are very unique to data centers. So data center networking would fall into that category. Now, what about collaboration? Collaboration is all about when you want to add to your existing data network, voice, video, and instant messaging. So collaboration is how do we allow our, how do we take our existing data network and allow our users to use all these other tools to collaborate, to work together on this existing data network. So collaboration is talking about IP phones, you know, learning about what an IP phone is, what the special protocols are that an IP phone needs to be able to operate. How does an IP phone translate uh, your voice into ones and zeros are suitable for a network? When you, when you type in a number, you know, like 555-1234 five, 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 into an IP phone, where's that number go? How, uh, in this, this network, how does it know where the other IP phone is? how to optimize the network so that if this network is carrying both voice and data, we want to prioritize the voice. We don't want the voice to be dropped or delayed. Same thing with video, same thing with instant messaging. Collaboration is how do we layer all those additional technologies 
onto our data network. So everything works seamlessly and works well. That is collaboration. And then lastly, of course, there's security. And security is just like it sounds. Network security answers questions like, how do I make sure that only authorized users are allowed to actually get into my routers and switches and program them and configure them and lock other people out from doing that? How do I make sure that only authorized users are even allowed onto my network in the first place? If someone walks into my building and sits down in an empty cube or training room and plugs their laptop up into an RJ45 jack in the wall, what's to prevent them from getting network connectivity and now doing something bad on my network? Network security answers that question. Network security is all about, okay, how do I allow the outside world through the internet to get into my network so they can view my websites, but not view other stuff on my network that's private? And if there's an attack going on from the outside, if somebody from the outside is trying to attack my network and bring it down, how can I detect that and stop it from happening? All of that falls into the realm of network security. So above and beyond all the physical components that you have to buy to put into a network, you also have to start learning about these various different specialties here. At a minimum, you have to know routing and switching, right? If, if you don't know routing and switching, then you don't even know the basics of how do I configure my routers and switches to know where everything is and how to get to everything. So routing and switching is the basic fundamental baseline that you have to learn. And that's what the CCNA routing and switching certification is really heavily into is routing and switching. The CCNA routing and switching exam, if you go down that road, also touches on security a little bit. Um, doesn't really talk about collaboration. It just introduces a couple of high level concepts and doesn't really talk about data center at all. So those are more specialty certifications that you would get after you have this fundamental baseline knowledge of routing and switching. So with that, that concludes that particular section. Let me see if you guys have any questions for me. So, Fahad, I see you're saying, can you please explain what is SD-WAN? Well, I'm going to take a stab at that. And if somebody listening um, detects me going off on the wrong course, please let me know. But I, I'm assuming that SD-WAN stands for a software-defined WAN. There you, you know, several years back, this new thing came out, which was called software-defined networking. And I think a SD-WAN is sort of a, a permutation of that, a software-defined WAN. So whether you're talking about software-defined networking or software-defined WAN, this whole concept of software-defined basically means this. For the longest time, networks were of the type that if you were the network administrator, if you were controlling the network, your job would be to occasionally log into individual devices, log into a switch here, log into a router here, and then program or configure that device to turn on various features, to get it to do what you need it to do, and then you'd step back and hopefully everything would just work. But the idea was, before you did any of that, you'd have to take a look at your network and you have to ask yourself questions like, okay, in my company, what kind of data is going through my network? How is that going to influence what features or protocols I turn on in my routers and switches. Um, what times of day are, is my network the most busy? So that will dictate, you know, during those certain times of days, those particular areas of the network I need to pay special attention to to make sure they're not getting overloaded. So you would do all of your assessment up front, try to paint yourself a really good picture of what the network was gonna be used for, and then you would go into the network one by one by one by one, router here, switch here, router here, switch here, and start configuring it to work based on this picture you had made for yourself. And then as the network changed, as the types of data going into your network became different, uh, as stuff in the network changed, you would have to log back into the routers and switches and manually make adjustments, make changes to account for that. Well, the idea of software-defined networking was a shift in all that. 
they said, so software defined networking says, okay, you're still going to start that way. You're still going to start by doing a, a network assessment, figure out what your network's going to be used for, what type of traffic's going to be on there, you know, who's authorized, who's not. You're still going to collect all that information. The first big change is that once you've got all that information, instead of logging into each device individually and programming it in a software defined network, you have one central like server somewhere. And that server, you log into the server and most likely using some sort of graphical interface, so you don't have to know necessarily commands, with a graphical interface, that server actually has the ability to reach out to all your networking devices and program them for you. So for example, you would go into the server and the software defined networking server would discover all your devices. So in the server, you'd see a nice picture and it'd show you, oh, here's a switch here, connect to this router. Here's a router here, connect to the switch because it automatically dynamically discovered everything. And then you might say, okay, well on this picture here, I want a certain type of uh, technology to operate here. So you'd type in the technology, click it, and the server would push out all the commands to those specialized devices to get it to do what you wanted. So that's one element of software defined networking is instead of having to log into each device individually, it's one central point of management from the server. Now, that has already existed for a long time. Uh, network management protocols have existed for decades that do that type of thing. What made software defined networking take it to the next level was now, and I, I don't think software defined networking is here yet. This is where they want it to go eventually. This is sort of like the long vision of software defined networking is where you could have a server connected to your network. All right, let's, let's say it's, uh, I don't know, some sort of um, uh, server that dishes up movies or something. I don't know, some sort of, you know, MPEG server or whatever. And when this server starts up, it would actually send a special message to the central software defined networking server, the server that controls your network. So the server that controls your network would talk to this one data center, this one uh, movie server, this video server. And the video would server would say, hey, I'm about to use the network. I need to get a video over to here. Here's the destination I need to get it to. Can you please program the network for me so that once my video starts going out, an optimized path will already be set up in advance, a path that's reserved just for my video that other stuff isn't using. And, and so, so instead of you, the human being, defining what the network is going to do, defining what protocols are in place, you, the human being, defining what paths traffic should take, now the software defines the network. The software running on this server communicates with your SDN server and says, this is what I need from the network. The SDN server then reaches out to all your routers and switches, programs them appropriately, so that server can now get the networking resources it needs. And then another server comes online, communicates to your SDN server and says, hey, I need to do something, these are my requirements, and the SDN server once again reaches out into the network, programs your routers and switches to accommodate that. So the software now in your servers is defining what the network will do. So I'm pretty sure that a software defined WAN is pretty much the exact same type of thing. It's just we're talking about having that type of automation happen in a WAN environment instead of a LAN environment. Uh, would you recommend going one route, say routing and switching all the way to CCIE or differentiate into CCNAs and the various different topics? Good question, Victor. What I typically recommend that people do is start at the CCNA routing and switching because you got to get that baseline knowledge. And then once you have your CCNA routing and switching, it's a good start, but I personally don't think you have enough depth yet at that level to branch out into a specialty. So after you're getting your CCNA routing and switching, I always recommend to people take it up to the next level which is the Cisco Certified Networking Professional, CCNP, in routing and switching, which is three separate tests. You have to pass all three tests to get your CCNP. Now, once you've got your CCNA and you've got your CCNP in routing and switching, at that point, 
the choice is really yours. It's really a very subjective thing. Uh, you can continue going up the silo there to now get your CCIE and routing and switching, or once you've got your CCMP routing and switching, at that point, I think you're ready to branch off into a specialty like security or collaboration or wireless if you want to do that. I definitely recommend getting an NA and an NP in routing and switching first before thinking about anything else. What do you think about Python for SDN? Yeah, Py so, so this, this picture I drew, software-defined networking, clearly there are programming and scripting languages going on in the background for your SDN controller to be able to reach out and discover things, reach out and program things, talk to the servers and have the servers talk to the controller saying, hey, this is what I want. A lot of that communication happens with Python and other programming languages. Um, so Python is, is definitely a, a good script. If you're gonna learn a scripting language, Python's a great scripting language to use. It seems to be becoming more and more popular all the time. For INE Labrax, what show commands do we need to run right away to discover what interfaces are connected to what devices and networks, or will the topology diagram show that clearly? A lot of that depends on which INE rack you are renting. If you're renting time on the CCNA, CCNP racks, the topology diagrams are very clear, I think, and they show you all of your connections. Um, uh, a very common command is show CDP neighbor. CDP as in Cisco Discovery Protocol. So if you type in show CDP neighbor, that should show you what things you're connected to. Uh, but the topology diagram should be accurate. Do I need to be an expert on Python for SDN or just need to know the basic things? Um, honestly, I can't answer that. I'm not an SDN. What I, what I just described to you is about the limit of what I know for software-defined networking. Uh, so deeper than that, I can't help you with that. So I would just recommend looking at, I know it sounds like shameless marketing, but if, if I was going to answer that question, we've got some video series on software defined networking. I would just watch some of those videos to see if it, if it answers that. Maybe look in some of our SDN video series to see if there's a particular video title about scripting or about Python to, to answer that. Hey, congratulations, Richard, on getting your CCNP. That's awesome. Victor, a good question. So rack rentals and workbooks are two completely different things. So, and it's intentionally set up that way because a lot of people like to create their own labs. They don't necessarily want to work through a pre-written workbook that somebody else created. A lot of people just want to rent time on the rack, and then once they're on the rack, they want to go through their own stuff. They want to practice stuff they read in a book. They want to practice stuff they saw in a video. So the rack rentals and the lab workbooks are two completely separate things. Uh, you purchase them independently. A lot of times when you purchase some of our bundles, uh, especially when we have sales, a lot of time bundles will come with a set of videos, workbooks, and rack rental tokens all rolled into one. Uh, but rack rentals and, and workbooks technically are separate. And uh, Richard, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you meant to ask where in my studies would you recommend I attend an in-person CCIE boot camp? You wrote when in my study. Um, actually, I think I know what you mean. Um, so we have at I and E, we have, um, and for those of you who are just who are just just scratching the surface with networking, the CCIE is is one of the upper level certifications that Cisco has. So the Cisco Certified Networking Associate is the fundamental sort of baseline certification, and then the Cisco Certified Internetworking Expert is the expert level certification. And in order to get a CCIE, 
It's actually a two-step process. Number one, you have to pass what they call a CCIE written exam. It's not really written, it's a computer-based exam, which is multiple choice. And then once you pass that, then you sit down for what's called the CCIE lab exam, where they sit you in front of some equipment and they tell you, okay, you need to configure this, you need to make this work, you need to troubleshoot this problem. So back to your question, Richard. Um, so we have CCIE written boot camp and a CCIE lab boot camp. So first of all, it would depend, you know, are you preparing for your written exam or are you preparing for your lab exam? Um, So if, if you are talking about the CCIE lab boot camp, which a lot more people attend, um, I would say after you've passed your written exam, you should probably be at least, at least five to six months into hardcore studying for your lab exam before you take our CCIE lab boot camp. Our lab boot camp is really and this is sort of true for all of our boot camps, even our CCNA level boot camps. All of our boot camps are really geared as like the final step in the process. You've already done, you know, hundreds of hours of self-study on your own. You've already watched videos, books. You've already made flashcards for yourself. You've already done labs on like our rack rentals or stuff like that. Um, you've been doing some practice tests and you're now consistently getting, you know, 85, 90% correct on the practice test. At that point, just before you schedule your exam is when you really should take our boot camps. So our boot camps are not designed to do at the beginning of the studying process. They're really best suited for the end of the studying process. That's just the best way to get the most out of our boot camps. IOT, Internet of Things, uh, what that stands for are, <laughs> well, things connected to the Internet. Uh, so, for example, the Internet of Things is this idea of how we're going to go beyond connecting just laptops, PCs, and servers to the Internet, and now we're going to connect to the Internet, you know, refrigerators, um, light sensors for your house for when your lights go on and off, um, your thermostat as far as, you know, setting the, the temperature, all that stuff connected to the internet. So the internet of things is this idea that you can be anywhere in the world and if you're connected to the internet, you can bring up your browser or whatever and via the internet, you can get to these various devices. You can get to your refrigerator and see if the temperature is too high or too low. You can get to your thermostat and set the temperature up or down. So it's, it's non-traditional things connected to the internet. That's really what the internet of things is all about. Yes, Eric, great, great answer. The, is, is essentially unregulated devices, exactly. All right, so let's see, is it possible to learn a technology until reach the season? Rather than starting to... So, uh, Lamchadi, to, to, uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, and then I'm gonna go on to the next section after answering this question. So, the CCNA does not have any prerequisites. You can start at ground zero with the CCNA. Now the, the mid-level certifications, the CCNPs, whether you're talking about a CCNP in routing and switching or security or data center, those all have prerequisites. You have to have already passed a CCNA in order to pursue your CCNP. The CCIE, funny enough, does not have any prerequisites. Technically speaking, and this is true, you could have no Cisco certifications, study like crazy for a year or a year and a half, and then go and pass and get your CCIE. You could go from zero to CCIE. So there's no prerequisites. Now, very few people do that, um, but they don't enforce any prerequisites for the CCIE. So you could take that path. All right, so enough of that. Let, let's go ahead, we still have more to go here. Let's go ahead and catch up. In this next section here, I want to talk about computer networking job roles, some job roles and descriptions. So in just a moment here, I'm going to talk about some job categories like network administrator, network architect. But regardless of 
what the role is, those roles all have different tasks, like this right here. Job tasks involved with computer networking fall into several different categories. So you first have to ask yourself, okay, what's, what's my ultimate objective? What interests me the most? Is what interests me the most is designing a network from scratch. You know, gathering the requirements of the customer, finding out from them what they're going to want to use their network for, what type of information is going to be on the network, how frequently it's going to be used, and then based on gathering all this research, put a network together for them. Okay, that would be under the realm of network design. Or do I want to work in the type of role where I go into an existing network and what I'm paid to do is to look at it and say, okay, what did you originally design this network for? Okay, I've got a good idea of that. Now take a look at the network and see, is it operating as expected? Is it ready to grow in the future? Is it bursting at the seams? Is it almost ready to crash and fail because it's, it's now doing something it was never intended to do? Is it operating efficiently? That would be network analysis, analyzing an existing network to see what, if anything, needs to be changed in it. Network implementation you know, is, is, do I really like to get my hands on stuff? You know, does it excite me the idea of taking routers and switches out of boxes and putting them into racks and cabling them and, and putting in different cards and memory and stuff like that and uh, configuring them and, and knowing the commands to get certain protocols and things working? That would be network implementation. And of course, network troubleshooting. I think you know what that means. Something goes wrong. You get to be the one to figure out what it is and be the hero that saves the day by fixing it. And then there's network monitoring. Right? These are the people that, that on a day-to-day -day basis, their main job is to look at an existing network to see if there's any trouble spots about to happen. Uh, you know, so that's, that's network monitoring. So networking job roles would require you to perform one or more of these duties. Very rarely will you end up doing a network job that is pigeonholed into just one of these things. Usually you'll be doing multiple of these things. So the jobs we're going to talk about are these, from an architect all the way down to technical support slash help desk. So let's start at the high end of network architects and engineers. So these are people that this would be like your long-term vision, your long-term goal to be a network architect or engineer. If you're starting out at ground zero, you're not going to do this right away. These are people that have years and years of experience, a lot of times working on several networks, not just having worked on one network, but worked on many through several different companies and getting different jobs. So they're generally hired to work on larger networks and network architects and engineers both do network design and conception. So this idea of, of figuring out what a network should look like from the ground up. Prototype testing, okay? so before telling a customer, okay, you need to spend $10 million and buy 300 switches and 400 routers. You know, once you've developed the network, do a prototype of it. You know, if I just buy like five switches and nine routers, can I get it to work the way it should work when I scale it up to a massively larger size? And network architects and engineers are often hired as consultants rather than W-2 employees. So what this means, especially with network architects, Network engineers can be W-2 employees, but network architects, vast majority of time, are independent contractors. These are people that are not full-time permanent employees that have you know, health benefits and, and holidays or, or PTOs and things like that. Network architects are people who make a lot of money, but they work in like defined projects. They'll go into a company and they'll be hired for like six months to do a project and they'll be very well paid for that project, and then they'll leave and go to another company. So a network architect really focuses on design. That is their main specialty, is designing a network, building a network from scratch, or taking an existing network, and then redefining it to do something completely different, and deciding what additional pieces need to be added to this existing network to get it to do this whole new task. Network engineer is typically more into the implementation role. In other words, they will 
take the designs that an architect comes up with. So an architect at the end of six months might come up with a, a document that's like 300 pages thick. It's got all sorts of pictures and diagrams in it that talks all about the features and protocols that need to run on this network, why they need to run, what the objectives are, this feature and protocol, where it needs to run. And that big document will be given to the engineer and it'll be the engineer's job to implement that to purchase the equipment in that document, to start configuring them as per the document's recommendations. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna show you the same topology several different times, but we're gonna be looking at it from different perspectives. So right now I'd like to look at it from the perspective of what would a network architect bring to the table, given this topology? So, if a network architect was hired to come into a, a company that already had this existing topology, the types of questions a network architect would be looking to answer is, you know, how many users are currently on this network? Where are they all located? How do you see yourself scaling in the future? Do you see those users moving around? Do you see yourself adding more departments or acquiring more companies in the future? Where do you see them being placed in this given network? What types of information is this network carrying net right now? What types of information do you think you might have it carrying in the future if you branch off into different directions with different product lines or different technologies or something? What type of service level agreements or SLAs do you need? A service level agreement says, okay, um, I will pay you for using this network if it meets a certain requirement. Like, okay, I, I will agree that this network has to always be up 99.999% of the time. It has to be capable of carrying this maximum amount of data. So what's the agreement between the network implementer and the network operators and the users as far as what service this network will be used for? Um, how do you need to separate traffic or groups? Do you need to separate traffic based on security? based on the quality of service for that traffic. Um, the network architect will even take a look at the building. You know, what material are your walls made out of? You know, walls are made out of concrete versus walls are made out of drywall react very differently to like Wi-Fi networking. Very important when you're dealing with Wi-Fi networking to understand what the building is made out of, where metal filing cabinets are located, you know, where the studs are and the ceilings and the wall and are they wooden, are they, are they metal beams? Um, all that stuff is very important. So a network architect will get all this information and then based on that, look at your existing network and create a document that says, okay, here's where your network needs to change. In this portion over here, you need to implement this. In this portion over here, we need to modify it to look like this. And then their job will be done and they'll be handsomely paid for that and they'll walk away. And now the network architect's job is finished. And now the network engineer comes into play. So now the network engineer is given this document that the network architect came up with, and it's the network engineer's job to implement it. So if the, uh, if the network architect said, okay, you need to buy another 300 routers, another 400 switches, and in this portion of the network right here, I want you to implement some new feature, some new feature you're not currently running. I want you to implement it, and I want you to do this type of thing here. Well, the network engineer will say, okay, um, before I roll out all these devices, I've never had experience with that feature before. So let me set up a little mock lab, a little test lab of like maybe six routers and 10 switches and get some practice on that feature. Implement that feature, make that feature work the way this document says it should work. And if I can get it to work correctly and I wanna be able to identify any bugs that might exist, once I've got that, then I'll have the warm fuzzies to now buy all that stuff and implement it on a larger scale. So the network engineer will do some prototype testing to make sure that he or she can do the things this document says needs to be done. The network engineer will purchase the equipment. You know, there's lots of different kinds of routers and switches. So the network engineer might be in charge of deciding what type, what make and model of router and switch needs to be purchased to fulfill this document's requests. Um, so, so those are all, the, and then the network engineer will, will implement all this stuff and configure it, test it, make sure it's working. So that's the network engineer. 
Now, like I said, if you're starting at ground zero, you're not gonna be doing either one of these two roles. These are like long-term vision for you in your career. A lot of people after, a lot of people when they're pursuing their CCNA, their sort of short to intermediate goal is to work as a network administrator. Now a network administrator, it, a lot of it depends on the size of the company you work for and the size of the network you work on. A lot of times in small to mid-sized companies, you should be aware that network administrators will work on servers as well as the network infrastructure. So if you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, I, I've read that network administrator is a good job, it's a stable job, it pays well, and I've gotten this idea of what routers and switches do. I want to work as a network administrator and I want to work all day long on routers and switches. Well, you might get a job like that, but more likely, you'll be working with routers and switches and servers, which means you'll also be expected to know like Microsoft server operating system or Linux or something like that. You'll be expected to know how to set up and maintain an email, an internal email system, how to set up and maintain an internal file system. So a lot of that stuff will be the job of the network administrator in addition to working on routers and switches. Now, if you work for a really large company like Cisco or Google or IBM or something, well then yeah, their network administrators probably work just on the network infrastructure, the routers and switches. They probably have a whole different staff that works on the server side of things. So, in addition to possibly working on servers or not, the network administrator will install and configure new equipment. So a lot of times, you know, they'll be the ones, you know, that the boxes will come in from Cisco or from your Cisco reseller and they will unpack the switches, the routers, the firewalls, the access points, and they'll be the ones to, you know, attach the access point to the ceiling and cable it up to go into the, the, uh, the wiring closet and put the routers and switches into the racks, you know, connect them to the AC outlets, cable them up with the appropriate cables, and then get on there and configure them, configure the, the features and the protocols per what the specifications say, cabling of equipment, and implementing change requests and implementing upgrades. Uh, so the, a lot of times a network administrator will have to swap out one router for another if a router fails, or maybe have to swap out a certain memory card from a router switch if the memory fails, um, swap out a bad cable, upgrade the software from one version to another because there's new software that came out that has you know fixes to certain bugs. So those are the various things that a network administrator will do. So network administrator really doesn't have anything to do with network design, okay? So the idea of figuring out what the network should do and how to change the network to get it to do what you want, that's the architect, that's the engineer's responsibility, not the network administrator. Now you may also start out as a technical support engineer. This is someone who does phone support Okay, so this is someone who typically provides remote troubleshooting report uh, support without any hands-on installation of equipment. Now before you say, oh yuck, that sounds boring just to sit behind a phone, hold on for just a second. There's some very be good benefits to working as a technical support engineer. Um, Yes, it's true that you know, you're not the one who's breaking a sweat hauling these big 30 to 50 pound routers and switches out of boxes and precariously dangling them over your head as you're trying to shove it into a rack and put some screws in there. You don't have to do that. You don't have to you know, figure out where these cables that look like a snake's nest go from one end to the other. That's not your job. But as a technical support engineer, what's great is that you're sitting in your cube and you'll get these phone calls or these emails with troubleshooting tickets. And so you will actually get to learn a lot of different technologies by remotely troubleshooting technologies and, and hardware over the phone. So while you're not doing installation, you're doing remote troubleshooting support. Um, that was my first job in the world of networking was as a technical support engineer for Cisco. And I knew nothing about networking, absolutely zippo. And I started my networking journey working behind the phones, uh, working as technical support and answering one customer call after the other, every single day doing five to seven cases, day in, day out, day in, day out. 
every case was unique, every case was different, but I started building up a real broad range of technologies, a real, and, and I started getting specialized in certain things I saw happen over and over and over again. So it gives you a great foundational knowledge of software and network operating systems. All right, now let's talk about your character, your personality. You might be thinking, okay, is this something that I could do? Is this something I would be successful at? So who is right for the job? Here's some personality characteristics you need to have to be successful. Number one, you need to be highly organized, okay? So go home, look in your bedroom. If it looks like a hurricane went through there, mm, you might want to think about this. Number two, enjoy learning new things. The world of networking is ever changing. It's, there's always something new to learn. Maybe you don't like that. Maybe that intimidates you. Um, a lot of people it does. So this, this will be a constant learning curve to do this role. Willing to work off hours. A lot of the changes you make to a network, a lot of times have to be done off hours. You, you can't make changes to routers and switches during normal daytime because people are working on those devices. You might kick them off the network. So you might ha you, you have to be willing to go in sometimes. Not, not a lot, hopefully, but every once in a while, you're going to have to go in at 11, 12 o'clock at night and possibly work till 6 o'clock the next morning to implement some of these changes. Critical thinker. You have to be good at troubleshooting. You, know, you have to be uh, able to handle stress under fire. Uh, so when people send you a, a call or an email screaming and crying because part of the network's down, you can't flip out over that. You have to be able to calmly diagnose and fix the situation without letting their stress become your stress. And you have to work well with other people. And lastly, you should be able to sit in front of a computer monitor for extended periods of time. Most of these jobs, they are not going to give you a lot of exercise. It's going to be sitting in front of a computer most of the time doing it. All right, so as far as a network administrator, very common question, how much to pay do they make? It really varies. It varies a lot. It depends on what country you're in, uh, even within the same country, like here within the United States, depending on what part of the United States you're in, the pay will vary. So I, I collected these, these numbers here from four different websites that you can see. I'll make this a little bit bigger. Um, you know, if you want to, you could take a screenshot of this, but you can see it's pretty variable. Uh, from pay, payscale.com was the lowest at around $37,000 per year. But it seems like the national average, at least here in the United States, for a network administrator is around the low 60s, the low to mid 60s, as far as $60,000 a year. That seems to be the average. All right, let's go back to our Q&A and see if there's any unanswered questions. Just reading through your questions right now. Uh, so, Mohammed, you you're mentioned that you recently completed your CCNP in routing and switching. You're studying for your CCIE, but many people say that you should have a CCNA knowledge for service providers and data center. If, if routing and switching really fascinates you, if, if, if you've enjoyed learning that, especially if you just recently completed your routing and switching CCNP, I would go for the routing and switching CCIE. Um, also, a lot of it has to do with, you know, how much you deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, in other words, it's, it's very easy to forget this stuff if you're not dealing with it a lot over and over and over again. Right now, routing and switching is fresh in your mind. Right now, you've, you've still got a lot of stuff about switches and routers and routing protocols and stuff that you learned, which will carry over beautifully into the CCIE routing and switching. If 
right now, if you diverted yourself and you started uh, studying for like the CCNA collaboration or the CCNA data center, that's great. But if at some point you want to go back and ultimately get your CCIE and routing and switching, it'll be a lot harder for you if you left the world of routing and switching for six to nine months to get a CCNA in something completely unrelated, and then you go back to it. CCIEs are still very high in demand, um, still very high in demand. So, I mean, it's ultimately your choice, um, but I just want to throw that out there and let you make what you want of that. So, uh, Internetwork Training asks, I need to know about DWDM technology. What exactly is it all about? So, DWDM is Dense Wave Division Multiplexing. It's a technology for optical networking. Uh, so, instead of using copper cables to send electricity, which represents ones and zeros, now you're talking about fiber optic cables that are made of like very fine filaments of like uh, glass or plastic filament and laser light, especially in DWDM, laser light and the different frequencies and colors of the lasers represent the ones and zeros. So DWDM is all about that technology and how that works. Uh, no, I don't have any OTV training. I'm sure i &E has some. I personally haven't done any of that, but I would just search at streaming.ine.com just through our various videos and see if any of them mention OTV. Very common question, uh, will software-defined networking damage a network engineer's jobs and salaries? Um, I don't think so. Well, let me put a caveat on that. So, remember, what is software-defined networking doing? You've got this, this SDN controller, which is a server, which is discovering the network devices and then sending out programming commands to program the network devices. Now, as long as that soft, that SDN controller is able to do that, everything works great. But what happens if that SDN controller fails? Or if that SDN controller somehow loses its connectivity to those routers and switches? There's always gonna be a need for people to know the background technologies and commands to make the routers and switches work. Another thing, um, in that SDN controller, let's just say the routers, for example. So you, you, you want to use that SDN controller to configure your routers. And what you want your routers to do is you want the routers to learn of all the different networks in your company, what the different paths are to those networks, and what the best path is to the network. So now in your SDN controller, you've got some options there, some on like a pull-down menu maybe. Maybe one option is to use something called EIGRP. Another option is to use OSPF. Another option is to use, to use ISIS. Well, if you haven't studied the basics of routing and switching, you have no idea what those things are. Could you answer, is EIGRP better than OSPF? No, because you wouldn't know what they do. Could you answer, what things can EIGRP do that OSPF can't do? No, you can't. So, just because you're sitting in front of that SDN controller, and you've got in front of you all these choices of various buttons you can press and pull down menus you can do and things you can slide. If you don't ultimately understand what the protocols do, what they're designed for, what their strengths and weaknesses are, that nice flashy GUI doesn't do you any good whatsoever. And like I said, if all of a sudden that SDN controller loses connectivity to those routers and switches, you're still gonna need, to have, you're still gonna need somebody who's capable of logging into an individual router switch, just like the good old days, and do troubleshooting without the GUI. So, uh, you know, that stuff is always going to be there. Uh, 
Uh, let's see here, Eric, I'm reading your question. How does information security tie into these roles? I know job titles vary, but how does the importance of security implementation vary? Is there usually a designated team we would work with? Once again, a lot of that depends on the size of the company. Um, really large companies, once again, like Cisco, like Google, they will have information security departments and a lot of times they will be subdivide into different sections. For example, you'll have some information security specialists who specialize in the servers. Their job is to know the servers really well, common attacks on servers, common vulnerabilities in the software running on those servers, and to protect those servers against those types of things. They may know absolutely nothing about routers and switches, but they know how to strengthen and protect the data on the servers really well. And then there will be those other security specialists who know the routing and switching side. They know how to harden and protect your routers and switches against attacks. And they know the various protocols and things to do that. So security really breaks down into those sort of two different silos. The people that know security on the software side really well, and the people that know security on the, the router and switching side really well. All right, I'll take one or two more questions and then we'll, we'll keep going. Um, Anirud, you say I have almost one year of experience in a company which is a customer of multiple ISPs, okay? I need a suggestion from you whether I should now move my career towards ISP service providers or more core routing and switching. Um, and then up above that you said you're a CCNP RNS certified, also working as a network engineer in a MNC logistics company. Um, well, if you want to work for an ISP, Absolutely. You'd want to move towards ISP service providers. Uh, you'd want to move towards the service, there's a CCNA service provider, CCNP and CCIE service provider, which are geared towards where the specialties of, of networking that service providers need to know. Uh, because service providers are very unique. They, they have to know things, because you know, like you said, they're connecting to thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of customers. The amount of data that passes through their network is incredible. Their networks are very large a lot of security, um, so there's very specialized things that ISP engineers have to know. Now, if you don't plan on working for an ISP, if your ultimate goal is not to move to an ISP, but to stay in your current company and you are a customer of the ISP, you probably want to stick with your core routing and switching. You probably just want to stick with the, the CCIE and routing and switching as, as your ultimate goal. Um, and yes, internet network training, you said ultimately whatever we do in routers and switches, so things that you do right now with configuration commands, logging into routers and switches, are the same things we're going to be doing in SDM programming to make our network configuration easy. Are you correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's entirely right. Now with SDM, it goes above and beyond that because you have to know how to connect to servers, how servers you know, dynamically communicate their needs to the SDN controller. That's a whole different world. Uh, but yes, what you wrote is correct. All right, and Itil Costa, thank you for the opportunity. I'm doing a, a MSC in networking, but I don't have any networking experience, just a CCNA. To gain experience, do you have any suggestions on that case? As a matter of fact, I could not have asked for a better segue. So that's going to lead me to my last section here, which I title, Where Do I Go From Here? So let's talk about that. So this topic fascinates you. You want to pursue it. So you start studying for your CCNA, or like in your case, you've got a CCNA, but you don't really have any real world experience. Where do you go from here? So I've got some bullets to talk about this. 
So step number one, I would find somebody that does the job. You know, at whatever, wherever you work or whatever school you go to, even at your church, if you go to a church, find someone who works as a network admin and talk to that person. Ask them some questions like this. Say, hey, you know, can I, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Can I buy you some tea? I'm fascinated with what you do. I'm thinking I might want to go into that in the future. Would you, could I take you out to lunch for an hour and just pick your brain on some things? And ask them these questions. You know, tell me a little bit about what you do. You know, what's your day look like? What are some of the things that, that you really enjoy about your job? What gives you a lot of stress about your job? What do you like about it? What do you dislike about it? What kind of experience did you have prior to getting hired? You know, how did you get from where you are now, where you started, to where you are now? How did you get your learning? How did you get your breaks? Um, what skills do you consider important for your job? Um, and have them ask you, say, what kind of roadmap would they suggest? Say, hey, look, here's where I am right now. This is what I know. This is what I don't know. I'd like to eventually do the type of thing you're doing. What would you suggest? You know, and it, it really helps, you know, it'll make them feel important, right? You're saying, hey, guide me, shape me, help me to learn here. And I'm sure most people would be more than happy who are doing this job to sit down with you and answer those types of questions. Um, there's a lot of YouTube videos out there where network engineers are interviewed. For example, somebody mentioned this earlier, Eli the Computer Guy. If you go to YouTube, where you are right now, and you do a search for Eli the Computer Guy, one of the things that he does is he often interviews people in different job roles. He's got lots of different videos where he has interviewed network admins and network engineers, and he has asked them these types of questions. Spend a few hours watching his videos to get an idea as far as how they got to where they are. Okay, what else should you do? I would recommend that you purchase some equipment. Not a lot, just like three devices, two routers and a switch. Now this is not mandatory, this is just recommended. Um, and there's a couple here, the 3725 routers, those are fairly cheap as of February of last year. They're around $80 each. 3560 switches, once again as of February, were $100 each. And also there's a reason I'm specifying 3725 routers because there's a free software out there called GNS3. Let me write that right here. GNS3. And within GNS3 you can create router topologies of like 10 routers, 12 routers, 15 routers. It's just really limited by how much memory you have in your laptop, your PC. But GNS3 requires that it be paired up with real Cisco software. And this particular model of router has the software that works with GNS3. So if you've already got a couple of these routers, now you can just take the software off the routers, put it in your laptop, and run it in GNS3, and create much larger topologies. So, why am I suggesting that you purchase two routers and a switch? Well, it's because there's some things that you can only get experience with, only learn, if you're physically right there in front of a device. You know, a lot of stuff, probably the vast majority of things you need to get your CCNA, you can do from renting time on a rack or using some programs like GNS3 or something like that. But to actually be an effective network admin, there's certain things you can only learn if you're physically in front of something, like you can see right here. You know, how do you physically connect your laptop to a router switch so you can control it? How do you do that? What type of cable do you need? Where are some of the gotchas with that? The LED status, you know, when the lights are blinking red versus orange versus green, why are they doing that? What does that mean? Cabling experience, the experience with what types of cables get plugged into what types of connectors, what types of problems you could have where a cable, you know, a pin gets bent or broken, or a cable is loose, and what does that look like? Upgrading and down, downloading software. Really can only do that if you've got physical equipment in front of you to practice. Password recovery. This is the idea of, okay, I try to get into a router or switch, try to get into the command line, and I don't know the password. Well, there's certain steps you can go through to get around that, but you have to be physically in front of the device to follow those steps. Uh, sniffer traces, a lot of times you can only do if you're physically in front of a device. And 
Last thing I want to talk about here are the various Cisco certifications. We, we've already covered a lot of these. I mentioned that the, uh, the beginning certifications is the, the CCENT, which stands for the Cisco Certified Entry Level Technician. So you only have to pass a single exam for that. Oops, because <laughs> it'd be nice if I showed it to you guys. I'm sorry, I had my big face on there the whole time, the slide wasn't even on. All right, so let me back up here for just a second. Okay, so these are the hardware I recommended that you purchase, and these are the bullet points I talked about, about why you'd want to have that hardware, the things you can do with it. I'll give you a second to take a screenshot of that if you wish. And then before this, these were the recommendations I had for what to do when you're talking to a network admin, when you're taking you know, him or her out to lunch or coffee, things to ask them about their job. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to take a screenshot of that one also, if you wish. All right, and the last thing I want to talk about were these certifications here. So the CCENT only requires that you pass one exam, which is called the ICND-1. Stands for interconnecting, actually I think it stands for interconnecting Cisco networking devices. Interconnecting Cisco networking devices. Now there's a second test called the ICND-2, and if you pass both of those, now you've got your CCNA, Cisco Certified Networking Associate. From there, the next level is the professional level. So as far as routing and switching goes, to get your CCNP routing and switching, you have to pass three exams. There's one exam called route, which as you can imagine, focuses on routing topics. One exam called switch, and there's one called T-shoot, which is a whole bunch of simulations testing your ability to troubleshoot various routing and switching issues. Now then if you continue to go further down the chain, now you can become an expert by getting a CCIE, Cisco Certified Internetworking Expert. And then lastly, if you've got a lot of money and a lot of brains, you could go for the Cisco Certified Architect, the CCAR. <laughs> now, there are less than 12 CCARs in the entire world. It is super, super hard. It's not just a test. Uh, to get a CCAR, you have to have demonstrated experience, like a certain level of years of experience. You have to submit like a thesis or something. You have to stand in front of a panel and answer a whole bunch of questions. It's like getting a doctorate. And then it costs something like $15,000 to get that. Um, if you're interested more in these certifications, what I would recommend doing is just start out by going to Google and here type in Cisco CCNA. Just start with that. Third link down here, as you can see, is training and certifications. If you click on that, it'll bring you to this page here where it talks about all the different certifications, the various specialties you can get. Here's the CCAR. <laughs> I'd love to know if any of you guys ever managed to get that. There's very few of those. You can see here, CC, I'm, I'm just in awe of the CCAR. I, I can't even imagine what it must be for someone to get this thing. Anyway, it's, it's pretty amazing.
Yeah, non-refundable fee of $3,750, $3,750. And then to sit in front of the board and be grilled by them, you're going to pay them $11,250. Let's just see. I haven't done this in a while. Current list Cisco CCARs. CCAR Hall of Fame. All right. Well, as of November of last year, there's 10. 10 of them worldwide. So you can see, pretty darn hard. Now, if you get to that level, you're going to make the big bucks. That's where you're going to be making lots and lots of money. And just remember, who helped you get there? Your friendly neighborhood instructor, Keith Bogart. So that is... And then the other thing here is you'll know some certifications have a D, like CCDA, CCDP. Those are geared towards design. Uh, so if you want to go in that track where you want to learn how to put networks together, design networks, you want to learn, you know, what are the appropriate questions I would ask a customer in order to design something, you want to go towards that level. So the CC N, like CCNA, CCNP, CCIE, those are all geared towards knowing the protocols, knowing how they work at a very deep level, knowing how to troubleshoot them, knowing how to implement them. It doesn't really answer the question, given a particular situation, which protocol is better to use? Which feature is better to use? What are the pros and cons of various different protocols? Those are more design-related questions. So that is all I have for this class. So let me go back one last time and see if there's any outstanding questions that I can answer. Oh, Muhammad, I see your, your comment there. In your CCMP exam, all of them had bugs, and giant bugs were there in the CCMP T-shoot exam. Can we face something like that in the CCIE lab? CCIE lab, from what I understand, it's, it's been a while since I did my CCIE lab, uh, but from those people I've talked to who got theirs, it's, that shouldn't be a problem. The CCIE lab should not have bugs in it. It's a pretty well-oiled machine at this point. Unfortunately, yes, some of the lower level certifications like the CCNA and the CCNP, some of the questions are just very poorly written, um, very ambiguous. Um, unfortunately, that's a fact of life for those lower level certifications, but you should not find that to be an issue at the CCIE lab level. Are the CCI labs expensive? Yeah, not as expensive as eleven thousand uh, dollars, but they are fairly expensive. Let's see here. It's been a while since I looked at the price. Let's just go back and look at that. All right, CCIE routing and switching. All right, schedule and pay for the written exam. So the written exam is like three hundred, four hundred dollars. All right, schedule and pay for the lab exam. How much are they talking about for that? Cost, 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 cost. Where is the cost? All right, so it looks like it's 1,600 US dollars per attempt. So that's how much the CCIE lab costs, $1,600. Uh, Internetwork training, you're talking about uh, using the, the EVE next generation software to practice routing and switching, service provider, so on and so forth. Um, a lot of those things like EVE, like Cisco's Viral, like GNS3 are really, really great for routers. So anything that you could do on a router, you can do in those things. Unfortunately, they still haven't caught up with switches yet. And 
the fundamental reason behind that is because if you think of the think of the architecture of a router, okay. Um, for example, think of the architecture of your laptop. Okay, your laptop has a CPU, right? That's the brain of your laptop, and the brain of your laptop does most of the work in your laptop. You know, whenever you open up a document, it's there. You know, whenever you run a program, it's there. So, if I want to create a, let's say I was working on a, on a machine and I want to import some software that emulated a laptop. Okay, I, I import some software that emulated like Microsoft Windows 10. Okay, I could take the, the software of Windows 10, the actual software of Windows 10, tweak it a little bit and run on this box and this box would think it was running on the CPU of a laptop when in reality it wasn't. But there's certain things in a laptop that the CPU doesn't do. For example, think about your, your uh, video, your display adapters, your, your, like, your graphics card. Okay, Your graphics card is a piece of specialized hardware that sort of offloads the CPU from doing something. Your graphics card does something very specialized very, very quickly. That's what it's designed for. Well, if I take Windows 10 and I tweak it and I modify it so I can run it on a tablet, for example. All right, let's say in this tablet I was running like a, a simulated version of Windows 10. That simulated version of Windows 10 would not be able to do what my graphics card can do because that graphics card is a specialized piece of hardware. So what does that have to do with Viral and GNS3 and stuff like that? Well, all those things, Viral, GNS3, uh, Eve, what they do is they take Cisco iOS software and they tweak it a little bit, they change it a little bit so you can run it on a server instead of running it on a real router. So instead of that software running within a real router's box, a physical metal box of a router, it's running in like a, a Linux server or a Windows server or something instead. Now if we're talking about routers, that's not a big deal because the vast majority of what routers do is done in their brain, is done in their CPU, which is where the iOS lives. So you're basically just copying the brain, changing a little bit to run on a server. On a switch, that's not the case. The switch is sort of like that other example I just gave you of the, of the graphics adapter. The switch has a brain, it's got a CPU, so all the things that the brain or CPU does, you could do in these virals and Eve NG and stuff like that, but there's a lot of stuff that a switch does that's done in specialized hardware, specialized ASICs and memory cards and stuff like that, that the CPU, the brain of the switch, the software never sees, never touches. It's all done in specialized hardware. And that stuff is not replicated when you're using Eve or Viral or GNS3. And so at the CCNA level, that's why I recommend using Packet Tracer because Packet Tracer has simulated routers, simulated switches that do probably 90% of what you would need to be able to practice for the CCNA. Once you get to the higher level certifications like CCNP and CCIE, now some of those more advanced switching concepts that are done in hardware, in the specialized hardware, you can't practice those unless you actually have a real physical switch. Or if you use rack rentals like INE's rack rentals or somebody else's rack rentals. Viral, Eve, GNS3, the switches in there just can't do that stuff because it's all simulated stuff. So I hope that answers that question. Um, we do have some tutorials and I hope it uh, sort of sparked your interest in the world of networking and you take it to the next level. So thank you for watching everybody and I hope you all have a great day. See you later.
around you who have varying degrees of networking experience, who you can bounce ideas off of, and who can give you some ideas as to how this stuff is used in the real world. In the